Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's my great pleasure to welcome one of the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva University, Rabbi Daniel Feldman. Rabbi Feldman is not only a Rosh Hashiva, he's a Rav of a shul of Or Sadia in Teaneck, New Jersey. He is the executive editor of the Reitz Initiative of YU Press, an author of a number of Sfarim, both in English and in Hebrew, and a co-editor of more than 10 volumes on Talmudic essays and Jewish thought. And most importantly, he's a wonderful teacher. Rabbi Feldman, thank you so much for joining us today. Always a pleasure to be with you, Rabbi. Thank you virtually, in person, in any format we can get. Well, I, I especially appreciate the fact that I know you had to do a lot of shifting around of schedules. So thank you very much for giving me this time today. What I really want to just get started with, there's so many different areas of of Jewish thought and, uh, and halacha and, uh, and just communal life that you're involved in. But one of the most fascinating things that I still remember from several years ago is the fact that you authored an article that appears in the RCA Sitter regarding mitzvot ben adam l'chavero in a shul. That most of us consider the shuls a place where we're interacting with God. And we seem to forget we're also interacting with one another. And it seems to be a passion of yours. Your English books are also dealing with interpersonal relationships. Where did you, where did this come from, this passion and this expertise? Well, you know, they say those who can't do teach. So you figure that uh, the best way to try to work on it is to try to learn about it. And uh, the more we can expose ourselves to the sources, and the halacha has so much to say about this very difficult area of life of trying to train ourselves how to treat other people. And it's such a challenge that it's a lifelong project. So the more we can learn about what the sources have to say, which is much more than we appreciate. There's so much in the halacha and it doesn't get enough attention. So I thought long ago that maybe if we had more exposure to what's in the Sarim, which is really so much, that maybe that would make a difference. So I'm hoping at least for myself, it'll make a difference. And I'm trying to work on that and to figure while I'm doing that, I could share it with everybody else and maybe well, together, that'll have so some bit of an impact. You visited shuls all around the country. And I know none of these- Nothing's better than Teaneck in Chicago, I gotta tell I, you, those well, were, we, those we were have, two tops. We have Ken's and we have Romanian, and Teaneck has your family. So I'm not sure how it balances, but I, I appreciate being number two. <laughs> but when you've been visiting communities, and I know it doesn't happen in your shul, and it definitely doesn't happen in my shul, but what would you say is the greatest challenge that exists in a, in a shul regarding Ben Adam Lechavero, the interpersonal side of, of Jewish life? Well, it is easy to lose sight. You know, it's hard to remember what exactly is the focus, the idea that we're all on a journey together uh, and that we're all trying to grow at the same time. And there's so many competing priorities and you, know, you want to try to dive in, in a serious way and that requires concentration and that requires focus and to what what it takes to be able to concentrate yourself is not what it takes for other people to concentrate and someone else may not be as familiar with the davening and may not need the same pace and may not need the same kinds of level of quiet that others may need and may not need the same kind of guidance or may need more guidance and you know they say that with the Shal Salanter, i don't know if the story is true or apocryphal but the reason that he was spurred to start the muslim movement is because he witnessed an exchange, maybe it was on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur or sometime similar, that he saw somebody was looking for help in the davening and he approached somebody else who was davening very fervently and he wanted to look into his sitter to get some guidance as to where things were holding. And that other person who was davening with such focus and intention pushed that guy away who was looking for help. And the Yisrael's impression of that incident was that if somebody in his own pursuit of an intense davening experience could push away somebody else who was needing help, then there's something very off kilter about the balance that we need to have in our shared world experience. 
and that he had to try to bring that back into balance with the Muslim movement. Well, it's, it's interesting. I find this um, challenge in shul as well. There was a time, and, and I'm sure you remember it as well, where not everyone who came to Orthodox shuls was familiar with the, with the davening, where pages were announced very regularly. There was greater formality than we find perhaps today. And I often get pushback from people. If I announce a page, they're telling, they say, we don't, we're not that kind of shul, but I see people out there who may not know how to daven and need the, those couple of pages. How do, you, how do you strike, if I'm in the middle of davening and I see a person who doesn't seem to be able to follow, and let's say I'm even in the middle of Birchot Kriyat Shema where I'm not allowed to talk, am I able to help a person, to go over to that person, show them, show them the page if necessary, even say a word or two to help guide them? You are able to do that. And the question in terms of striking the balance overall, that's a constantly evolving process. And uh, really the most important thing is to have patience with each other. And as far as we're not that kind of show, we are that kind of show, the most important thing is to be welcoming and understanding of where people are and to appreciate that it may be true that there may not always be a need for that. And I think at my show, we're also always working back and forth to try to find what is the perfect balance and what is the perfect atmosphere. And it takes a little bit of push and pull, a little bit of give and take. And, and that's okay, as long as people are patient and tolerant of each other. Well, do you have a feeling that, in other words, has, have our shuls changed so much that they're not able to be welcoming anymore? Do you find Orthodox shuls that have that ability still? In your travels? Yes. Yeah. I think I don't I don't think that shuls are intentionally not welcoming. I think there are much greater levels of education than there were once upon a time. So I think people forget that not everybody is educated as they are. And they could use a little reminding. I think we all forget that a little bit. I don't think it's intentional. Um, but there's more work to be done. And <laughs> So, and moving, for instance, moving away from shuls into the rest of the world, you have Talmidim at Yeshiva. In fact, you thank you for uh, moving your shear to a little bit of a different time this afternoon so we could talk. Um, our students today are really challenged because of social media. When it comes to social media, if someone posts something on social media that they uh, heard a rumor or something like that, something that even if they posted about themselves, what are the potential pitfalls from a halachic perspective? Let's say a person does something silly or just you know wants to go on TikTok and do a, you'll excuse me, a stupid dance. Is there a problem with that halachically? Is there a problem with posting it or problem with uh, posting it? There's a ton of problems. There's a ton to be worried about and to be concerned about. We live in a whole different world now. And it's not a world that's all problems. There's a lot of wonderful things that go along with that. But we do have to be very concerned with what we are posting and what we're consuming and the image we're projecting and what we're taking in and the culture that's being created and the sensitivities that are being eroded. And you don't even know where to start. Uh, what do you think is the greatest? If you look at your Talmudim today, who are among the creme de la creme of our community, the students. Wow, well, some of them, university. especially, you know, uh, well, they, uh, they from Chicago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they are, you know, they're really above and beyond the average person. What do you think is the biggest challenge they're facing because of technology today in the realm of the interpersonal? And what would you advise them as a Rebbe? Well, just to be aware, you know, we're now in uh, Sefer Vayikra, and uh, Sefer Vayikra begins with the very, very beginning of Sefer Vayikra has a comment. Rashi tells us that God called out to Moshe from the Oomoe, and that Moshe could hear, and that people in between couldn't hear. And the Chafetz Chaim has a comment that sometimes there are things in the Torah that we can't relate to. And then technology comes and invents something that allows us to relate. So the Chavot Chaim in his door, he says a telephone 
allowed us to relate to that because the idea that you could have you could hear something from far away that people in between couldn't hear didn't make any sense. And then the telephone was invented. And you could understand how you could hear something that was coming from a distance that people in between wouldn't be able to hear. So in our generation, the internet helps us to relate to the fact that Chazal told us that we should appreciate the Hakol Nechtav Zetinkis, that everything that we do has a permanent effect. So that's always been the case, but we weren't able to relate to it. So in a sense, it's a positive that the internet reminds us that what we say and what we do has consequences, but it also creates that reality in a more lasting and intense way. So the fact is that anything that gets posted on the internet is immediately available for the entire world to consume and is there forever and cannot be erased. And we are stuck with the consequences of whatever we post there, whether they are frivolous or harmful or devastating. And it's a whole new world. And therefore, we know that the, that we're told that and if that was ever true, it's true in so much of a greater sense now than it ever has been. And that if whatever we say is harmful, can be harmful. So if it's there now forever and it travels around the world instantaneously, then we're living with a whole new world. And that's something we have to be deeply cognizant of. And it's not just that that happens, but our sensitivity is so significantly altered. And that's something I try to highlight to students in a very significant way. We were just talking about the perm spiel in the past week and been trying to explain why it is that the Purim Spiel, which is a hallowed tradition in our yeshiva, and we were so happy to be able to bring it back for the first time in three years since COVID, and was trying to explain why it is that we do have a spiel in our yeshiva when so many of the postmen were concerned about it. And we suggested that it's because we're able to create an environment where we hope it conveys love and affection and not degradation and mockery. And I thought that that was based on a Tosus in Erchen in Baba Basra, where Tosus interprets the Gemara to say that even if we're sometimes nasty, but when we're speaking in public or we're speaking in the presence of the person, then presumably we're not going to be nasty. So maybe we'll be nasty when we're talking in private or the person we're talking about is not there. But when the person is there or a lot of people are there, then presumably we're not going to be nasty. And so I was highlighting from there that you see how much difference context makes. And so hopefully on Purim, we have a context where it's clear that the spirit is a loving and positive one. But parenthetically, it was noting that you see that Tosis was writing whatever, a thousand years ago, 900 years ago, and was assuming that even if we're nasty in private, but we won't be nasty when the person we're talking about is able to hear or when there are a lot of people present. Is that true now? Nowadays, when we communicate on the World Wide Web or on social media, where the whole world can see what we're saying, and certainly the person we're talking about is able to hear, do these assumptions still apply? So it's, and if it's, not, then our culture has changed. It's not just that what we say travels farther and lasts longer. Our sensitivities have fundamentally been altered. And then we have to work with a whole new set of understanding. And so what's, what's interesting, there's this anonymity that people feel when they're on social media. David Pelkovitz has talked about the fact when you don't see a person and you're talking to them, you have different, the, the mind works differently. You think as if your statements are safe. It's very much like being in a crowd where you think no one sees you because you're in a crowd. The anonymity is only part of it, though. Plato already spoke about the anonymity being a problem, but anonymity is a bigger problem. That for sure insulates people against feeling like they are at all vulnerable to the consequences of their actions. But what they find in the internet is that even without anonymity, they have what's called the online disinhibition effect, which is that you don't feel that you're actually dealing with people. And that even if your name is there, but when you're 
sitting behind the screen in your pajamas in your parents' basement, you feel like you are completely disconnected from people and from the consequences of what you're saying. And it's just a whole different world. And therefore, we are functioning in a very different way. And you can see it in all different fashions. And it means that we have to rewrite the rules of behavior and bring a whole different kind of proactivity and sensitivity to how we operate. But are we doing that? In other words, are we being not proactive? Yet. Not yet. Yeah. I mean, one, one way in which you can see this, it's not just about Lashon Hara, it's about on us Devarim, but like, for example, if you look at any of the news websites, the from news websites, and if Rahman al God forbid, is a, a tragedy that's reported. So they have comments. You read these comments, you could faint, but you, re you read the comments, the things that people say there, they would never say that at a Shiva house. Right? But they know that the family is reading these comments. So is it mutter, is it permissible for a person who has a website like that to even allow comments to be made? What what level of responsibility? You have to be very, very careful. You have to be very, be very careful. We find in Hokus Lashon Hara that there's a concept of Avak Lashon Hara, which means that not only am I responsible for what I say, I'm also responsible for what I provoke. So if I say something and it's predictable that it's going to provoke a reaction from you, so apparently that's also my responsibility. So you can question how far that goes, but it's scary. You have to be very careful. So I'm not going to talk in terms of Mithra Rasa, but there's certainly a liability there of some significance. And you just you can do a survey of your own and just read the comments on some of these websites. And I assume these people are not cruel people by nature, but they're writing things there that you cannot imagine they would go to a shit house and say them to the faces of the people who are sitting there and yet they're putting them out there to be read so as one of the experts and as you've mentioned before if you can't teach you have to do it or those who can't do it will teach about it in order to be able to learn about it uh, which is a different play on that famous saying we'll deal for another time but the the reality is what's our responsibility as rabbis in the in the community as educators to to reach out to the to children to students to parents i don't hear this and as a major theme in in sermons given in shuls or or lectures that are being given in the public well i, I don't know if that's true i guess we can keep chipping away at it we we keep working now you were kind to say that to the rca twitter because it's a, a passion of mine but you neglected to mention the editors of the RCA Twitter who made sure that that was included. I think they must have been very thoughtful to try to put that in these sections in the Twitter. So I think people like Rabbi Menke, who work hard to make sure to arrange that such material is available, that's a big part of the solution. I no, I listen. When it comes to Ben Adam Lechavero and Ashul, I always find it amazing. And we're back to that original topic when it's called the Beit Knesset. We, it, by design, the whole idea is that we bring together community and the community has to be fostered, whether it's because of a minion or the nature of the Beit Knesset where people have to be together. And unfortunately, we, that balance you had referred to before between being together and being alone with God at the same time is a challenge. The people who come late to shul and tap, their, tap on the shoulder of the person sitting in their favorite seat. You're in my chair. Please move. I remember many years ago, Rabbi Riskin, when, it, when Efrat was first growing, there was a sign up in shul that if you come more than, I think it was, I don't remember if it was 20 minutes or 30 minutes late to shul, you no longer have a fixed seat, the makom kavua in the shul. You can't, you can't ask someone to, to keep it for you that long. But we don't, we don't think about the other people. And that's why it was important to have your section in the sitter, but also why you, the books you've been publishing on these areas are so fascinating. There's just not a lot covered by them. And no, not, not all the people writing about them. Um, if I can, we don't have a lot more time, but if I could just shift for a moment to your role as the executive editor of the YU Press, the REITs part of YU Press, there've been a, there's been 
in my mind, an explosion of books that have come out from Reed since you've stepped into that role. There are books on, on halacha, there are books on Jewish thought. Is there a specific area that you're trying to move forward or is it just taking all of the talent at Yeshiva and finding out how you can help them publish? It's more the latter. Thank God we have a lot of wonderful rebellion here at Yeshiva and I have a lot to say. And there's more that they have to say than we have the ability to process it right now. Thank God there's so much Torah to be shared. And we're working to try to find the right tools in order to be able to distribute it and to get it out there and partners to work with in order to be able to spread it. And thank God it's been growing, both in Hebrew and in English. And we're working and try to find all of the all of the sponsors and all of the distribution venues and all of the various methods to, to get it out there. It's, can I, those who are looking to partner with us, we have a lot of different ways to bring the fantastic Torah of our Rashi Yeshiva to the world. What's, what's the, um, the, the next few books that you'll be publishing? Can you think offhand? Well, stay tuned. You know, uh, but we have uh, wonderful scars from a Shefter Shlita, from a Rosenzweig Shlita. We have uh, a lot in the pipeline. Uh, we have a uh, very major, we saw that there was uh, a kind of a prototype of a major project involving the Torah of Salvechik and our uh, senior current Rashi Yeshiva in terms of Psach Halacha that was released a few months ago and it's going to be part of a much larger, more formal series coming forward. There's a lot in the pipeline and there's a lot more coming behind it. And anyone who's interested in partnering with us should definitely be in touch. I see the smile on that piece as well. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of balance, in terms of the time you spend in the shul, the time you spend teaching at yeshiva, the time you spend editing, you do a tremendous amount of things. And you're also, thank God, we've had the privilege of having you come to Chicago as a scholar in residence on a number of occasions. How is your shul doing? Is it growing? Thank God. It's a beautiful community. If they're watching this, they get 100% of the time. Oh. <laughs> of course, they do. And, and also, at the same time, you're from, you are, by the way, an offspring of two very, very distinguished families. Your father was a very significant rabbi in the Jewish community, and your father-in-law also was a very, very significant rub for many years, even though he's retired now. It's a continuation of, of a path that's really extraordinary, but it's also interesting to be the son and the son-in-law of Rabbonim and to choose to go into the Rabbonus. Uh, you don't always find that. Was this... I, I said at my father's funeral that my parents hid for me that there was anything not to enjoy about it. So it was too late. <laughs> it was too late. Well, I, Rabbi Feldman, I know that while our time today was a little shortened because of uh, circumstances that were beyond everyone's control. I don't want to hold you back from going to your shear. I know that was supposed to start at 12 at 1.30 your time. It's now 12.30 our time. So I want to thank you for your time. I also want to thank you for the leadership that you have shown in our community and especially for the Torah you've taught. And I focus so much today on the Ben Adam Lechavero because it's an area that you have added so much to our thought about. For those who are watching this this entire broadcast is also going to be available as an Apple podcast a little later today. Everything is always stored both in Facebook Live and also on the kankins.org website. And Rabbi Feldman, I look forward to welcoming you soon to Chicago once again. And I thank you for your efforts to make sure you could join me today. Have a wonderful day. And thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you virtually, in person, in all fashions. And please keep up the wonderful work. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you.